gentlemen, boys and ghouls, to all of our non-binary friends, to everyone on the spectrum and in between, welcome to a Freaky Friday episode of The Shutter Show. I am your host, David Marlowe, and here is my temporary co-host, Ken Stackney. How you doing, David? <laughs> Ken, I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good. David, why don't you do me a favor real quick and just put one, uh, click down on the minus button real quick. Yep. Boop. You, boop. There we go. Talk. We're leaving this oh, all in. This, this, yay! There we go. That much better. Yeah. Okay, this all, yeah. This, this is all staying in. Uh, you see behind stays. the scenes. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, yeah, David. No, I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing. I'm doing good. I guess. Um, get ready here for uh, leaving for Hawaii. I'm. I'm leaving on the uh, the thirtieth, and uh, so I'm getting everything. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'm getting everything squared yeah. away here. And, and now is uh, this make, the and this is not for the year long project. This is just something to that they're putting you on for like a month, right? No. Um, so this is actually that project. I don't know if it's going to go for the full year at this point. Um, uh, we, we we will find out. Um, but uh, this is I'm going in. Uh, some discussions were made, and I'm going in for pre production and pre building and getting sets set up. And this way, I will be involved with more of the visual design of things. Uh, I'm pretty excited about it. It's going to be um, it's going to be really cool. It's kind of like Pootie Tang meets all that jazz. It's going to be a wild project. Oh, fun. Man, I am, Ken, I am so unbelievably happy for you. And, and yeah, it's going to be like to, to folks listening and watching. Um, a, we appreciate everybody's patience who kind of looks forward to episodes because we've gotten a couple of messages here and there asking when the next one is up uh, just because of our crazy schedules with all the, the weird transitional stuff happening. Yeah, um, you kind of had to just me moving to an island, you know. Yeah, all and then stuff. and then I came back from our honeymoon and pretty much worked for three weeks straight, and I never, and I rarely saw my wife after after we got back. Um, yeah, things just ended up being a lot busier than we expected. So it's kind of one of those things we try to do it um, with a week between, but you know, we put an episode out when we're able to record, just kind of given the craziness of life and and all that happens in it but yeah, well, the Ken, people at home, yeah the people at home will notice that we have not monetized this podcast uh, monetized this podcast yet so we are not this is free so you know what yeah. you know what we're so you're do? welcome yeah exactly you're welcome we're doing this for free and uh, as as we had discussed at the beginning um we are going to do this podcast for as long as that it is fun and part of it being fun means it being a little rough around the edges. And sometimes it means it being a day late or so. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from Community is um, uh, TV shows need to be uh, like family. Sometimes they need to be allowed to have a bad day. And uh, we at the Shutter Show <laughs> are all about sometimes having a bad day. Yeah. Uh, Ken, and, and speaking of bad days. Yes, absolutely. Let's talk oh. about a perfect uh, transition. Let's talk about ruining your afternoon your weekend your entire week let's talk about henry portrait of a motherfucking serial killer oh my god so this this was one of those those few occasions where i had seen this film and ken had not i think i saw this in college um and it had been a while and i put it on and i forgot just how brutal and dark it is and granted the the title <laughs> henry portrait of a serial killer kind of gives away that it's you know bleak and, and, and th there, there's wrong. there I, I i find that this movie gets confused with exploitation films i i this is because like some this is very might, different like, than an exploitation film. oh yeah no no like like because this might say like somebody might compare this to like i spit on your grave or or some variation of like a film like that when it is anything but what this is, is it's a character study. Um, mm -hmm. It's the character study of a week in the life of a sociopath. Um, keep in mind also, this was made in 1986. 
um, or at least around like the early 1980s. Uh, and I, I believe it was released in 1986 because uh, it, it sat on the shelf for a while. I think they, they came out with a finished product. This was originally going to be two hours long, by the way. Uh, and there was a point where they showed a black and white version of it to production. And let's just say that they were not happy with what they spent their minuscule $100,000 on. Oh man. And so, so it sat on a shelf for several years. Um, and then they, they trimmed off a lot of the fat and they finally released it. And to everyone's surprise, it got a lot of critical praise. Yeah. And I think the one that really like launched this into being a cult film Ebert. was sort of the two thumbs up from Siskel and Ebert, who make a, like a very good point about this film because it this was uh, given an adult rating because mm-hmm. originally back then they had like rated X, then R was kind of very re- like you could do just about anything with R and R could be multiple different things. PG-13 didn't exist yet. And NC-17 didn't exist either. It was either like R or adult. And this was one of the movies I believe that was put forward of an example of like why you could make a movie that if you want to talk about what's actually on screen, like what you can write down that is a definition of a fucked up image or something uncomfortable or horrific, there's actually not a lot in this movie that's very easy to put your thumb on. Um, one of the things that I think that is uh, important to remember is if you go back and read the MPAA review, they basically were like, "Yeah, there's no cuts you can make." That's and they make they, they are not a, yeah, they're not legally allowed to tell the director what cuts to make. They can maybe suggest large portions, but they can't say you need to cut this in order for us to approve this or give it this rating. Um, because that would be an infringement on First Amendment rights. So we as an organization cannot do that. Um, but yeah, Siskel and Ebert don't have much regard for the MPAA um, yes, and said that this, like, this in and of itself is a, a dark character study of people that exist. Like this film is based off of Henry Lee Lucas and um, his partner Otis, uh, who was renamed in this as just Otis. Um, who went on a pretty much a giant killing spree for a large portion of their adult lives. And it is, it's, um, they, the director um, who, sorry, blanking on his, yeah, John McNaughton, uh, who was also the, uh, the co-writer along with Richard Fire, um, based this off of a sort of documentary video that he had watched about Henry Lee Lucas. In fact, the opening shot is a recreation from a crime photo of one of the known actual murders that Henry Lee Lucas committed. Oh, because wow. there's, yeah. So if, if folks don't know that much about who Henry Lee Lucas is, there's a, a really good documentary on Netflix called Confessions of a Killer. I think that, I think that's the title, mm-hmm. but it, it's, he was known for confessing to hundreds of murders, whether oh, wow. he committed those murders is, is, is up in it the air, is, but yeah. Is up in the air, but for a period of time, there were a lot of unsolved murders, and especially in Texas, if they, if police wanted a crime solved that have sort of just been sitting on a cold case shelf, mm-hmm. they brought it to him. He would confess in exchange for, you know, delicacies like KFC and maybe a TV in his cell. And he, it just kind of became sensationalized. And, you know, there was no DNA evidence testing back then. So he just kind of became a bit of a celebrity. And, and this was and this being made in 1986, just as like those confessions were happening. Um, like there's a, oh God, what was it? I'm trying to remember America's Most Wanted. You know, the host of that? Yeah, uh, John something. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm blanking on the name and I apologize, but his his John young, Walsh John Walsh John Walsh's young son was abducted by Henry and Otis who murdered and decapitated him oh shit okay wow all right learning lots of stuff man yeah okay. 
So like those are the types of people that this film is telling you a story about. And, you know, as most good storytellers often do, they do their absolute best to humanize the most unhumanizable. And it's, it's the idea of there is a point where I think some audience members actually find themselves rooting for Otis and Henry, and that's when they're buying the television set. I think I, I would argue that you could find yourself rooting for Henry. Rooting for Otis, no. I think, is, no. a, is, is a very, like, Otis, to me, uh, he's the unremarkable piece of shit here. He's just selfish. Henry, to me, is, and I put this in quotes, the more interesting character, because he is, like, he sees the world through Henry's lens. Like, he understands, like, okay, not to sound like a total sociopath, but Henry is right when he's like, oh, if you want to kill somebody, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to go to Lower Wacker. We're going to flag somebody down randomly. We're going to shoot them and we're going to drive away and we're going to park at a place where there are no security cameras. And that is horrific and terrible and the absolute product of a deranged mind that has thought about this too much. But he's not yeah. wrong if you want to get away with murder. And that's what I think is which was a lot That's easier what, to do in the 80s. That, that is one of the things that I find so disturbing about this movie. And I think disturbing is definitely one of the best words that you can use to describe this film. Because it, it is a movie that just gets under your skin. It's a movie that permeates your thoughts for days. It is a movie that makes you think strange thoughts that you shouldn't, you didn't think you should be thinking. It's it is a movie that tr that truly understands what the term horrific means. Like I can't put enough trigger warnings on this movie. If Absolutely, been, no. If, if you been, if mm. yeah, if you have any history with any kind of domestic or physical abuse in any way, shape, or form, holy shit, is this movie gonna set you off? Um, there's there, there's so many things that I don't even like. There, there's so many things about this movie that set me off that I didn't know they would set me off. They were trigger warnings for. Uh, they were just things that just set off things that I didn't know yeah. were gonna. Set, if this movie is, like like I cannot begin to describe how well made this movie is and how much I kind of can't recommend that you spend your time watching it unless what you're trying to get out of this is, is enjoyment well like well Enter, like, or entertainment are, yes if you are trying to devastate yourself if you are trying to like this movie to me is a movie kind of like schindler's list where like you watch no it one, once you watch it once or you're i mean you're not watching it for the enjoyment of watching it there's a lot of there's a lot of horror movies that have quote unquote fucked up stuff that happened in it. But this one's not fun to watch. There no. is no sense of tee hee hee. There is no... Though there is a bizarre amount of dark comedy in this yeah, that there... almost... that I did catch myself every once in a while like given a chuckle and it's mostly the interactions between Otis and uh and henry like when they're just when it's just the two of them like they literally just shot a man in the stomach or no 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 it's uh henry had just killed two women in front of otis for the first time and then takes otis to go get food and then otis you can see is sort of processing all of this and being yeah. like that was really fucked up and meanwhile henry's just chowing down on some french fries and then he just goes you want some fries? But like, you can see Henry like checking in on Otis and like eyeing him down. But then he just goes, you want some French fries? And then Otis like looks at the bag of French fries, thinks for a second, takes a couple, like eats, and then decides, yeah, you know what? Fuck it, give me the bag. Like, so, it, 
it's very well done in terms of just subtle humor to sort of alleviate what just happened. So we don't talk about politics very much on the podcast here, and I don't want to talk about politics too much here. But what yeah. I will point out here is this movie is an excellent example of the fallacy of, but they're a nice person. Yes. The idea that, you know, there will be times when you will find out a family member or a friend has voted or supported a particular position that you hardcore disagree with. And you will bring this up to a mutual friend. And that person will usually say, come on, you know, they're a good person, or you know that you're a nice person, or they're a good Christian, or they're a good dad. And they will give you all of these excuses for why the thing that you have just pointed out is not in line with their character. And I would point out, go watch this movie. Find yourself, like, find times that you aren't kind of rooting for Henry. Because sometimes to some people, he's a nice guy. And other times he just snaps the necks of, of sex workers in his car for no reason other than he's mad. And, yeah. and I, does, I would argue. And, and, and hold on. Does sharing his fries with Otis, do you really believe that that tiny act of kindness counteracts the whole other thing? Oh yeah, I understand no. it. Yeah, I understand if you believe that if you've only encountered one. But the problem is, is often when faced with the evidence that the person has both shared their fries with you and snapped the neck of a prostitute in the back of a car because they were just mad, that a lot of people are like, "But they're nice." But come on, they yeah. babysit my kids sometimes. They fix my alternator. I don't care. Yeah. They're bad Can, people. There is so the shop that I work at. Um, for one thing, this this job that I've held, and, and I'm, I'm really not going to say the name of the shop because I don't, A, I'm not going to use yeah. anybody's full name because I don't want to call anybody out. It's not my business to do so. But there is like um, at least 50% of the people working here, and it's a non-union shop, 50% of the people working there are convicted felons, um, have done like some serious hard time. Um, one of them, uh, a, a gentleman named Dennis, not going to use his last name, but come to learn, and I learned this from several co-workers who just told me, and I thought they were fucking with me, but they're like, oh yeah, no, uh, Dennis helped his dad skin a man alive. And I'm like, I'm <laughs> like, no, he didn't. He's like, yeah, no, he did. He, yeah, went, to jail. Yeah. Uh -huh. he went to jail for it. it. Like it happened in the eighties. The, like it was in the news and there was a while like, ago, but he definitely yeah. did do that. There are documentary episodes of this where he is interviewed. Go look it up. And I looked it up and sure enough, like this gentleman, Dennis was raised in a white supremacist doomsday cult, um, like raised from like from a baby, like his dad was the leader of this cult and was stupid crazy till the day he died. Um, and like, they, this was in the middle of, um, you know, the, the middle of, of God, what was that? I think it was like, was it Kansas, North Dakota? It, I can't remember the state exactly, but, um, but eventually his father began losing control of his followers and so started making examples of some of his followers. And some of the things that he made them do included things like uh, fornicating with the livestock on the farm where everyone was staying, um, fornicate, like forcing men to fornicate with other men. Um, and eventually one of the guys who he had the most conflict with, he took him and his young five-year-old son, um, tortured the father in front of his son, made Dennis participate, who was 15 at the time, made Dennis participate in skinning this man from his waist down mm -hmm. and beat him like, and Dennis beat him brutally. And, and, and David, let's, and let's just be clear to the people at home. This is a coworker who this you is have a had, like you, who you, you, you've had no, like you have no beef with this man, correct? No, like you I, have I have no, I yeah, have no beef with this man. Yeah. No, yeah, but like, no laundry to wash. No, no yeah. problem to you. He is just, a coworker who I'd be even willing. Let, let's take it a step further, David. Has he ever done anything simply kind to you, like offer you sugar for your coffee, or like 
you know, helped you uh, helped you grab stuff from the back of your car, like something. He's, I assume at some point at, in your life, I was having difficulty thing. squaring up a piece that we were doing for um, for one of these sets, and he showed me how to properly square up this one piece. Like he showed me a couple of different carpentry techniques. Um, the dude is good at his job. Like he's he's a little loud and and kind of overly masculine but what's very strange about him is like he went to jail at 16 and he spent 12 like he got life he got like 25 years to life but got off in a technicality because he was tried as an adult when he was actually a minor and so he was released uh 12 years later and then had to go from being in a cult to being in prison to then being a free man with adult responsibilities and eventually fathered a, a son and be, was a trucker for a little while and got up to some other crazy shit. But when you talk to him, he is strangely progressive, which makes sense because politics right now, especially I would say on the far right, has become very cultish. And yeah. so Dennis knows a cult when he sees one. Yeah. And, but it's like, like he's very pro women like he's just like like some he'll see a story be like god man that's really fucked up and i just look over like like dude's a fucking raiders fan um you know he has like basic interests like like you know he seems he is completely rehabilitated and he's now a paralegal um he like talking to him you would not know that he helped his father skin a man alive yeah. so like bringing this back to like Henry portrait of a serial killer. Someone can seem nice to you on the surface, especially if you have been somebody who has gone through trauma yourself and this person is nice to you. It, it, it you kind of want to believe the best, like you want to see the best in this person. And I will say this movie, man, like spoilers, I guess, but man, if there's ever a movie that tells you don't try and see the good in people, because if they're bad people, I don't care if they're being nice now. In fact, they're actually probably not great. This movie yeah. does it because, man, man uh, I, I don't know if I, I don't even know if you can spoil it, but like the ending of this movie is just devastating. Like the ending of this movie just feels like someone punching me in the teeth mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And again, and like, I can't say enough good things about how effective this movie is and how much I don't want any of our audience to go watch it if, unless they're in, like, if you're a filmmaker and what you are doing is you are looking for a way to recapture a naturalistic style, if you are looking for a way to find sympathy in the worst possible characters, if you are, if you are looking, there's, there's a lot of technical stuff in Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, that if you are a filmmaker, I 100% think that you should be out there like looking, that you should be checking out, that there's so much to learn from this movie. That said, if you're looking for a good time, you're looking for just like a, a, a like if you like horror movies, this is not that, but this is a movie like, okay, so one of the biggest discussions in horror is what actually gets the definition of a horror movie. Is Rosemary's Baby a horror movie? Well, I would argue that Rosemary is raped by Satan. So yes, I would describe the act of being raped by Satan as horrific. Now, we don't see it happen in the movie, but it pretty clearly happens in the movie. And if you don't think that's horrific, I don't know what to tell you except you misunderstand what the word horrific means. And um, this is the same exact thing. This movie is yeah. horrific with a capital H. Is it fun? No. It is a bad time. It is uncomfortable. It is disturbing. It is upsetting. It makes you feel and think things that you didn't think that you would do. And if what you are looking to do is explore the peripheries of what cinema can make you feel, man, I cannot suggest Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer enough. But if you are looking for a fun time, I cannot 
no. suggest you, you watch look, this movie. Look elsewhere. There's, there's, there's another film that I would definitely compare this with, and it's more of a fictional story. Have you ever seen um, the movie Man Bites Dog? Oh, yeah, I know. Man Bites Dog is exactly what I was just thinking. Yes. This is, uh, and if, if you have not seen Man Bites Dog, for one thing, it is a fascinating, well-done film. Um, I think it takes place in Germany or France. I could be completely wrong about where it I takes place. I believe it's Germany. No, no, it's France, it's, if I remember right. It's been a while since it's uh, since I've seen it. But the, the, the plot of that is it's this film crew following a serial killer and, and recording his work and interviewing him between shoots and genuinely getting his overall opinions of the world and of people and of himself. And as the film progresses, they start participating in, in the crimes that this serial killer commits. And it gets unbelievably brutal and disgusting. And it was one of those cases where I'm just like, I, I do not feel good watching this, but it's, that is on very much on purpose. It's like uh, it Irreversible is. or Lahane. Um, there's um, Enter the Void is another great example of a movie that is very effective. But yeah. I, I don't know if I'd recommend. Like it's. I would it's, not um, recommend Enter the Void. It's very slow. So so we've t- oh man, Enter the Void. I think is uh, never mind. Uh, that's a whole other discussion. Enter the Void. I think is. And in, like a movie, uh, uh, Enter the Void, uh, uh, Wild and Crazy, I think it's up there with 2001 as one of the most wildly influential visual films of all time. That said, will ruin your weekend for sure. Not yeah. even close. Um, but it is, uh, th- th- there are things that I can't pull away. Like with this movie, man, the music is so good. Oh, it's so It's so simple, but so effective. Yeah, it's like a synth score that doesn't make me feel like a synth score. Um, it sticks with me, but it also doesn't have a, a melody that it makes me hum over and over again. There's um, the zooms in this movie, I think from just a, a cinematography standpoint are actually really good. They do a great job of using zooms to be naturalistic without making them big to-dos that they're doing with zooms which i don't know if you're a cinematographer is kind of a big thing zooms are very controversial over yeah. whether you'll use them or not um and and music itself was done by ken hale stephen a jones and robert mc uh mcnaughton those were the the three composers behind what i have to say is an unbelievably effective score yeah um and i think at some point we should definitely talk about um, the cast themselves, like the, the three main characters, because mm-hmm. holy shit. Because yeah, when I first saw this, like when I was like, okay, we're going to watch this film, I had completely forgotten about the character Otis, who I would argue is the worst of the characters in the sense that like Henry will murder you. Otis will rape you, murder you, and rape you some more. It's he he is the most disgusting of human beings. Um, and when that disgusting human being comes in contact with another disgusting human being, it only enhances how truly terrible he is. It, it's hard to explain how different they are, except um, I guess Henry will murder you, but Otis will murder you and record it on terrible VHS and then play it on a loop in his apartment. Yeah, that was a oh that and the that record. I, I think that is by Which far the, is the worse, right? The cringiest part of the 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 film is Yikes. when they're doing yeah. the when they're videotaping it. That's Ugh. it's like an that, abstraction on an abstraction that makes it all so much worse. The entire time, like I cannot begin to explain how much I did not enjoy watching this movie. It is well, it's it, it's I like I think. I would not change a thing about this film in terms no, of like it's like, perfect. Dude, like you, you wouldn't change it. the budget. You don't change the actors. You don't change. Yeah. Like, because here's the thing: the budget allows allowed them to be like, cool. How can we film this for cheap? Sixteen millimeter. Sixteen millimeter brings you into the Gringe, and yeah. brings like it makes it feel more real. 
it makes you feel like you're watching a home recording as you're it's watching what, yeah. them record. It's like what makes Texas Chainsaw Massacre in 16 so unnerving is it feels yeah. real. This just feels like this asshole's fucking home movies. And I, like, I, oh, man, most well, of the well, times well, I've seen these movies before we go in. And this is one I only knew on reputation in the entire time. I was just like, man, they were right. And also, yikesy doodles, I do not enjoy this movie. I mean, it's really good, but I did not enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. It, kind of like you said before, it, it's the movie you only watch once. You're like, like, okay, like now I see what people are talking about. I'm going to go take a shower and never watch that movie ever again. Yeah, like if your friend owns this movie, I'm just saying be wary of that friend. If that friend is 17, okay, they're just being a troll, I'm guessing. But also, if they have a pet disappear or something, be afraid. Like, I yeah. just, I don't know who wants to watch this movie. Like, I don't know who watches this movie and says, I want that on my shelf. Like, well, it's I just like, don't know who that is. It's like reading um, Nick Cutter's newest book, The Troop. Um, yeah, sure. sure. I, could read, I could read this book, and there are some unbelievably disturbing parts about it. And like, this is a good book. I'm never going to read it again because there's some seriously disturbing elements about it. Um, but yeah, it, it is for one thing, like this play, like you can tell that this was done by people from theater. Uh, like I so know. Are, okay. What, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, so, so several of these, like, like Tracy Arnold and Tom, T uh, Tolis who plays, um, uh, the sister and brother, uh, Otis and his sister, uh, they were from the organic theater in Chicago where the writer was also from. Mm -hmm. um, and Michael Rooker had done a good deal of theater with um, several of the members of organic theater as well. And so mm. they brought him in. And I remember they said during the audition, I think Michael Rooker had just gotten off of work and he came in from work. So he didn't have time to change for the audition. And so he just looked the part. Mm. And I remember like the, the direct uh, John McNaughton remembers him coming to the door, answering it and just thinking to himself, Oh my God, I hope this person can act. <laughs> oh my God. I hope this person can act. And thank fucking God. Like Michael Rooker acts his ass off in this. Oh, and so, he's so like, good. But the way, the way the scenes are laid out almost plays out like a Tracy let's play. Um, you know, Tracy, Tracy let's, uh, Tracy Letts has done, um, uh, he's done the, the uh, bug. He's done, um, oh gosh, what was the one with, um, that got adapted to screen with Matthew McConaughey? Um, uh, isn't that bug? No, no, no. It's, it's the one where he, he fucks a girl with a piece of chicken. Uh, oh God. It's been a while since I, I have, I've been oh, out of the uh, for a while. Uh, uh, yes, no, no, no. Um... Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, 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 hang on, yeah, hang on, I'm looking it up. Yep, yep, uh, I yep. Know this. Uh, uh, yeah, I know. Tracy, keep talking, I, 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 Tracy, I find it. let's, but yeah, it's, um, the, the way that it's laid out, where it's just a scene between Kill, uh, Killer Joe. Killer right? Joe, thank you, yes, yes, so he, he wrote things like, he, he wrote, um, plays like Killer Joe, Bug, um, you know, he's written for yeah. television and film quite a famously bit as well. Directed, yeah, famously directed by William Friedkin, who has blocked me on Twitter, and I don't know why we've never interacted. If someone can reach out to Billy Friedkin on Twitter and ask him why he blocked me, and if he'd unblock me because I didn't do anything, and I don't know why, I, I don't know why the director of The Exorcist has blocked me on Twitter. It's so weird. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, like, I love okay, Bobby I love Friedkin. you so much. Like, I love William Friedkin. He's so good. And he's blocked me on Twitter, and I don't know why. Maybe he meant to friend you, and he hit block by accident. And he's like, well, what's done so. is done. Uh, but, no, like, it's like, like, the way that it's laid out is very theatrical. It, it feels like a Tracy uh, Let's perform, uh, performance, where it's just three characters talking about mundane shit over beer in a rundown kitchen. Um, one of the character, like, one of the characters is actively somebody that you would like that you would avoid in most situations the other person is very quiet 
And then there's the 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 woman of the group who is uh, a little bit more um, open and uh, sexually oh, explorative. Yeah, exactly. Like she's um, the person that you know is bad things are going to happen to. Yeah, it's a real it, bummer. Yeah, it's but like towards the end, I find it to be very fascinating because like what the film does to humanize Henry is it gives him um this character becky who Mm -hmm. is a very sweet regular person who's just gone through like she's just she she's lived through some very traumatic times which includes being sexually abused by her father um and constantly ogled and googled at by otis and yeah eventually otis and then but the person that's nice to her is henry and Henry feels sort of a, a sympathy for this person and feels this urge to protect her to some extent. Um, one could say it's an attraction, but because Henry has also lived through some insane trauma, which includes like his mother doing terrible things to him, which has arguably, right I would yeah. say, you know, skewed his viewpoint of women and sex in general. Um, you are seeing this character wanting to be intimate with somebody, but not knowing how to be intimate with a human being. And the I only see... way he can be intimate with them is violently. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a story of a guy who doesn't know how to interact with people in any other way other than like murder. his immediate his immediate pleasure or their murder almost yeah like it's just he just doesn't see he just doesn't see other people as like he just sees them as things yeah and it's there's truly also seeing them as things yeah there's also homosexual undertones in this and because henry lee lucas and otis uh, as real people were lovers they hmm. they they were both homosexual and or at least some variation of bisexual um but both were sexual deviants in the sense that like yeah perverts going after underage kids and and such but like there were scenes that were completely cut from the film which included that relationship between the two. Oh, interesting uh which i think also they just they came off as kind of silly so that's why they cut them hmm. but you know again i think creates more layers for henry as the character like the 80s was not a time that you were openly homosexual i like, would say in 86 trying to make a uh, a, a relatable portrait of what a true homosexual relationship between those two is gonna while you're making this movie is gonna be incredibly difficult I just, like that just seems like a very hard needle to thread to me and I I, I don't I, I, I totally understand why those scenes even if they were done with the best of intentions were cut and I assume I, I haven't seen them. I don't know, but yeah, that that check that checks out. I don't know how else. <laughs> I don't know what yeah. else to say about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's uh, again, this film will absolutely ruin your day. But it is a fascinating character study that even Siskel and Ebert would agree is required viewing for people who love filmmaking. Um, mm-hmm. I because like there there is a solid comparison. Like one of the points that I think was very smart for them to make was like, okay, like the MPAA gave this an adult rating, but at the same time gave Rambo an R rating. Yeah. One has far more glorification of violence and death as entertainment than the other. The other just looks at it from a more reality based perspective. Whereas, you know, most of what passes for art, I would argue, is psychologically more harmful um, in the idea of being of glorifying mowing down people with a machine gun, um, glorifying like just sexualizing a woman and the horrible things that happen to her. Like there's horror movies with R ratings like the remake of I Spit on Your Grave. Like, mm-hmm. how is that, like, what 
makes the two different? And I think that's a solid question that Siskel and Ebert like brought forward. And they're like, like, no, like this is, I think this is a very unique film that makes people feel certain ways. And that is 100% the intended purpose of the film. I completely agree. Yeah. Um, but yes. So with that being said, um, Ken, do you have any final words on this film before we start wrapping up this episode? Um, the, the last thing I would say about this movie and particularly the transfer that is available on Shutter, is that it is gorgeous. You can see every single piece of film grain. You can see every, like you can see every detail. You can see every focus pull that wasn't perfect. You can see every single detail of this movie in its raw nakedness and it just for me makes the movie so much more disturbing is how much is just on display and i i both cannot recommend this movie enough and cannot recommend this movie at all if that makes sense ken by the way also i forgot to mention you know what i discovered in watching the making of of this film hmm. is that is that i am indirectly in like i am indirectly involved with the history of the director himself john mcdonald that yeah. john mcdonald which he did documentaries on uh gangster he did do, uh, gangster documentaries he also did a documentary on the world of wrestling hmm. and this was during the time of such wrestlers as dick the bruiser who was very good friends with my late father. Interesting. Who, okay. Yeah. My, my, my dad, Chuck Marlowe, was a, a sports broadcaster. And he passed away at 86. And so he uh, broadcasted from the... I'm, I'm sorry. He was Chuck Marlowe, voice of the who? Yeah. Uh, Chuck Marlowe. Uh, right? Yeah. Yeah. Chuck Marlowe is a voice of Indiana basketball. Um, he hosted the Bob Knight show for years and years. He announced from the Indy 500 from the pits for the longest time, which I got regular tickets to go to, um, which I would not argue is a good place for children to be. Huh. I, uh, and then he also was in his early days, a sports broadcaster for professional wrestling. And in one of the documentaries about professional wrestling, you can hear my dad's voice talking about the match between Dick the Bruiser and one of his, um, uh, the other guy that he's competing against. And it's, I had a real, huh, in, huh, interesting. Well, that's not a connection I expected to have, but well, there you go. There you it's go. A, yeah, yeah, really, really fucking weird. But yeah, with that, okay, with all that being said, um ken do you do you have uh, a movie for us next week i did not i i did not pick one so i am going to leave it to you this time i i have two both of which start with the letter p so okay. first is the john sales awesome creature feature piranha which is like an all-time banger super fun yeah and then also the new shutter exclusive that came out a couple of months ago called psycho gorman which I've heard amazing things about and I'm looking forward to uh, checking out. Uh, I heard about it originally from the uh, YouTube channel Thoughtsline, who is pretty great if you're into kind of leftist content. Um, if you're not, not your thing, that's fine. But Psycho Gorman, uh, the story of a young child who finds some sort of magical amulet, which creates some sort of demon creature, uh, which then has to do what they say. And apparently it's cute. And I'm all about it. And then Piranha, <laughs> which is a story about people dealing with Piranha. It is a Jaws ripoff, but it's funny. It's directed by Joe Dante, who did um, uh, Gremlins. It was written by John Sayles, who did a bunch of Oscar fancy stuff, and who I've also met in person and got to shake his hand. Um, so those are the two movies that I am suggesting. David, do you have any pluggables to plug? Can I sure do? Uh, first off, you can find me at underscore DW Marlowe, where I get up to my regular musings, where you can see uh, some of the different sets I might be working on, or just my everyday life with my wife. Um, you can also um, find us on Instagram at shutter underscore show, where I will be putting the poll up where you folks can pick the next film that we discuss between Piranha and Psycho Gorman. 
So feel free to check us out and any announcements we might have. Ken, what about yourself? Do you have any pluggables? You can check me out on Twitter and Instagram at Ken Stachnik, K-E-N-S-C-A-C-H-N-I-K. You can check uh, my dog out at Freddy Potatoes, both on Instagram and Twitter. And you can check... Yes, indeed, Mr. Potatoes, indeed. And you can also check out Shutter Show on Twitter at Shutter Show. Other than that, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of the internet, good night, good luck, and most importantly, go Go fuck yourselves. Love you. And get vaccinated. Get vaccinated and boosted. Bye-bye.